Okay. Good morning, everybody. We're back for this week's broker update. Myself, Amir, Michael Cochran with CMG Home Loans. So I think the first thing, of course, we're going to want to talk about is you know, the storm that we all yeah. went through last, last week. Um, I think we have a lot, a lot more devastation than, than we any of us have. thought yeah. we would have yeah. for a storm that really didn't hit us. Right. You know, um, obviously what we're looking at is a lot of storm surge damage, the beaches, Gulfport, um, all along the coast. All along the coast. Um, then on the bay side too, Shore yeah. Acres, Snell Isle, Venetian Isles. So we've all been talking, you know, what can we do? What can we do? What can we do? Because I'm sure that anybody who can would like to do something. So we are going to be opening up the back classroom for donation drop-offs Thursday and Friday, so tomorrow and Friday, and then again on Monday and Tuesday. And we kind of have a specific list because we've been getting a lot of information of what these community need, communities need. So let's start with gift cards, okay? Um, Publix, Target, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, a, a gas card, Wawa, Shell, Petco, and PetSmart. Those would be the, the really the gift cards that you all want to focus on because those are the places that are going to have what people are needing. Right. Okay. Yeah. What people, people are People have lost everything. You know? Everything. And so, you know, we're obviously we've talked to a lot of our agents who have been hit hard too. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we it's unbelievable how many agents we have that, yes. um, that have lost everything. Yes. And, you know, uh, one of um, Tina's... Uh, Processors, Monica, she was hit, and uh, Michael's counterpart, uh, Candace, yeah. was hit mm -hmm. as well, along with, uh, you know, Jim, uh, Jim he was Hoffman. in Reddington, uh, mm -hmm. Reddington Beach and whatnot. Uh, it, people lost everything. Yeah. And so, you know, they're, they're trying to get their bearings and, and whatnot at this moment in time. And so, food, water. Yes, uh, all you know, cleaning so supplies, all those supplies. Types. So, you know, the gift cards, I think, would be the, ideal. The gift cards are ideal. We do have a couple items on the list. I was in um, Gulfport on Sunday, and it is just heartbreaking what I saw in Gulfport. But some of the people in the area were telling us things like sunscreen, bug repellent, and like personal or baby wipes. A lot of these people are obviously out of their homes, but they're in Gulfport. They're kind of living outside. So these are the things that they need. <clears throat> so if you would just, keep, uh, just remember Thursday and Friday of this week, and then we're going to kind of split things up. I'll take some things south. Amir's going to take things his way. Mike Webb, Jess, we're all going to, we're going to split it all up and we're going to kind of get it all to all the spread the wealth. spread the wealth. We're going to spread the wealth. agents. If you are in need, please let us know. We want to help our family first. So that is very important to us. Also, agents, if you know or if you have rentals that are available, yeah. let us know that as well. We've got, you know, you don't know um, if one of your other Colleague. co colleagues, your other, thank you, your colleagues is displaced and maybe needs a place to live. Yeah, we you know? we're constantly, you know, receiving phone calls. Uh, you know, we, our house was devastated. We, you know, we're yes. looking for something, uh, you know, Jim fortunately was able to find something. Mm -hmm. I know Martine on the beach, she, uh, I think they were able to find something, but you know, they had, uh, some, they have pets too. Yeah. So that that's fun. a, that's a thing. Uh, but I've been seeing a lot of realtors come together and really promoting their listing, their rental listings that they've had and they're getting, you know, snapped up pretty quick yes, because they this, are this car movie. rentals. Yeah. Car, car rentals. Um, and um, I want to, Byron posted it, but no cash, please. No cash donations. We, we don't want to be dealing with cash. Yeah. And keep in mind that, yes, one man's trash is another one's treasure. But we really just want the items kind of that we, that I've, that I've kind of listed. Detailed today. Detailed yeah. today because we know this is what is needed. Okay. Um, okay, so let me give you the list of gift cards. Byron's going to uh, put it up there for you guys. Publix, <laughs> or he's going to try, <laughs> Target, Walmart, Lowe's, Home Depot, 
possibly gas cards. Wawa, I know is a good one. Shell. And then for our fur babies, Petco and PetSmart. Mm -hmm. um, did you get the items, the three things that I listed, Byron? Sunscreen, bug repellent, personal wipes. There's also a website that you can use if you need it. You can pass it on to neighbors, friends, family. It's called, it's hopeflorida.com. And it will, it has, oh, I think Byron's going to kind of pull it up for everybody to see. Right there where it says hurricane recovery or down there where it says get help, give help. Um, this is going to be kind of like a little one-stop shop. It's going to point people in the direction of any kind of business that they might need right. to help their recovery of this very, very tragic uh, weather event that we had. Right. And, you know, having these resources and whatnot, you know, not trying to uh, take light of the situation at all, but, you know, it, for realtors who, who weren't hit, it gives you a chance to reach out to those past clients too, uh -huh. you know, and, and, you know, whether they just need, uh, you know, help with getting to this website or they don't know where to turn, be that source of information because that's, you know, we live here, we work here. We want to help our community. Yeah. This is our community. These are our neighbors. So that is kind of what I have to start with. Yeah. And uh, I think the Nesters are. Yes. John and Joanne Nestor are doing. $5,000 donation. Yeah. Um, Charles Runberg Realty will be supplying gift cards. Integrity Title will be supplying gift cards. We will all be doing what we can. So whatever you can do, that would be wonderful. And hey, if you are one of those agents in need, let us know. We want to put you on our list. Yeah. Uh, we want to we help our in-house family, and then we'll go out from there. Exactly. But that's yep. family is most important. That's what we all are. That's the plan. So, you know, whether you want to email us, give us a call, um, send us a message, whatnot. Um, you know, we want, we definitely want to take care of, uh, you know, our, our family first. So yes, good stuff. All right. Uh, yeah. yeah. So from okay. there, I wanted to, you know, touch base on just a few things um, before we get into um you know, um, talking about insurance and uh, and lending um, during this this point in time after the storm. Um, for those of you who had a, a license renewals, if your license uh, license renewals were supposed to have been renewed by September thirtieth, uh, because of the storm, it was pushed out to October thirty first. So you got an extra month. Uh, which is great, uh, but still don't wait to the last minute. If you still haven't got your continuing ed or paid your renewal fee, get in there and take care of that. Uh, obviously, we're October 2nd now. October, yeah. October, October 2nd. 2nd. How did we get to October? I don't know. The year's almost over. Yeah. Uh, if you, you know, weren't here last week, uh, October 1st started the new flood disclosure that must go with every new listing or every active listing that you have. Um, you know, if, it, if you're listing, you know, you took it last month, but it's just been sitting on the market, it's still active, please get the new flood disclosure done for that. As well as if you're in a condo, uh, any new condos or any new uh, listings that are condos, any active listings that are condos, have them complete a new condo rider. The condo rider was updated as of October or October 1st. So um, it added uh, paragraph 11 on there. So get those updated. Um, and then, you know, just to plant the seed, to start thinking about it. Uh, hopefully, you know, most condos and HOAs will have sold before this. But um, as November comes around, the boards, they start doing their budgets and, you know, it, putting out what the new condo fee is, what the new HOA fee is. So if those fees are going to be changing, make sure you update your documents, uh, have the seller update those documents so you can provide them to the buyer. Um, you know, and I'll continue uh, updating people on that and reminding you as, as we come to the turn of the year. Um, so that's the stuff that's new in the real estate section right now. Okay. Uh, you know, going over, uh, I kind of want to, you know, pick Bernardo's yeah, brain. Yeah, I was going to say. Pick uh, Michael's brain here. Um, you know, because I'll tell you the common question that I've been getting over the past four or five days, well, ever since the um, um, uh, the storm is, hey, listing flooded. What do I do now? The seller doesn't want to do anything. They just want to sell the house as is, but they want to make their, um, 
they want to make their insurance claim, but they still want to sell the house. Can can that be done? Bernardo, how are you? <laughs> Good morning, guys. How you doing? Hey. So, uh, can it be done? I guess it can be done. It's not the the normal way to do it. Uh, it's very hard to get insurance, or it's impossible to get insurance with an open claim, open equity okay. claim. Um, it, it's going to be hard to get a buyer that is going to be able to justify the risk of buying a property without knowing how much the the problem with a flood, flood claim is if, um, if if your repair cost exceeds 50% of the value of the property. When I say value, it's replacement cost of the unit, not land, not real estate value. Um, it could trigger a complete new set of rules for rebuilding uh, okay. or, or fixing the place up. So I, I would stay away from that type of situation. Uh, also, there's an enormous amount of liability that you're going to be taking on by trying to market a property that you have no idea uh, what's going to look like uh, from from a uh, condition and also right. a financial standpoint. Um, I, I did get almost four feet of water in one of my properties uh, in Indian Rocks uh, last week. Oh, wow. uh, mm. it, it's a townhome, and it's, but it's set up as a condo. Uh, so there's all these gray areas in between who's going to pay for what, who's allowed to do what, and, and, and so on. Um, so it's not going to be easy. I, I, I think the, the, the main thing that I think we need to get out there is uh, we need to help people not to get scammed. That's that's uh, yes. probably, right. you know, the, the, the first thing to watch out for is all these scams, basically. Uh, price gouging is already kind of happening. So yeah. we need to make sure that that's something that you're – on top of your reporting it, if you see it, uh, obviously as realtors, we want to be able to provide these people shelter uh, and we want to make it uh, easier for them not to try to overcharge and make money on the situation. Um, you know, so I, I think from a, from a real estate standpoint uh, that relates to insurance, um, really it's just trying to do what we do on a day-to-day -day basis as realtors. Uh, and help our clients uh, navigate the insurance side of it um, as, as much as you can. Um, really, the, the, the reality of, of how complicated this next few months will be is it, it's, it's unprecedented in our area, at least. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You know, we have all these flood claims going on. There's people trying to file homeowners claims for flood losses which that opens a, another can of worms that 99% that of the time is not going to get anywhere. It's just going to create additional uh, headaches and paperwork for the owners who are doing it. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind. You know, if, if your house got flooded, this is a flood claim only. There is no homeowners that is going to respond to that unless you had wind damage. So finally, Bernardo, I have a quick question and maybe it's just a simple question, but I, I would assume that some people out there might have it. You don't live in a flood zone, so you didn't have flood insurance, but you got flooded. Well, there, there's not going to be any coverage through homeowners on that. Okay. Uh, FEMA is putting out uh, assistance money. Uh, if you go to FEMA.gov, uh, there, there's all kinds of information of things you can apply to. Uh, and that would that would actually that, it's money that is going to go to the flood areas, uh, the, the flood zones, per se. And the non-flood zones, but the people got affected by it. Um, okay. Also, another thing that most people don't realize is flood insurance does not have um, any money for for housing. So, if you're going to have to be out of your home for three, four, five, six months a year, who knows? Uh, th there is no money there for uh, rental assistance or, or temporary housing, uh, and that's not you know it's not something that you can buy as an add-on it's just not there uh mm -hmm. through, through through the national flood program so um assisting people with getting housing and maybe trying to subsidize that in any way uh you know for, for, from a from a real estate standpoint if you have a, a a owner that is willing to rent it for a little bit less than market just to help these people out considering that uh it's important uh and then you know another thing too is because that money is not there uh, most of these people are going to try to get back to their homes as fast as possible. So mm -hmm. expect, you know, you know, two, three month rentals to be uh, a, a pretty realistic scenario. Uh, and then you may have somebody else that will need the property uh, afterwards. Um, 
you know, documenting the loss is probably the biggest thing to do right now. Uh, take as many pictures as possible. Um, try to get your appliances, um, you know, document the models. Try to take pictures of the serial numbers. If, if at all possible, try to keep them in, in, in on site before uh, until you get a, a claims adjuster over. If you have to throw them out, make sure you document as much as possible. There are multiple pictures of the same appliance so, showing the damage showing, you know, like I said, the model and, and so on. Um, trying to mitigate additional losses is, is very important. I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're in line to get, you know, your, your drywall tear out or, or to get your carpet out or to get your stuff out of your home, if that, that hasn't happened yet, there's, there's mold already growing on it. I mean, it's been four, five days yeah. now, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, so make sure you wear a mask, a respirator uh, would probably be the ideal scenario, not just a, an N95. Uh, but try to get all that moisture out of the property uh, as quickly as possible, um, especially if you're going to sit around for a week or two waiting for someone to show up and actually do it. So th- those are really the main things. Um, I'm dealing with it right now. There's some things that I have never dealt with uh, from the consumer side. Um, so as, as, I, as I see the issues, as I see the blessings coming, um, I'll, I'll share with you guys You know, the, the next week. Probably we'll have a lot more to, uh, to relate. Um, right. As far as the process is concerned, thank God my unit was vacant at the time. Uh, this is not my primary home, so I, I'm, I'm not affected in any way. Um, we're trying to help our neighbors next door because everyone in the building pretty much lives there. So, you know, that's 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 really all it is to do right now. It's just to try to help, you know, your neighbor and your friends and, and do whatever you can to uh, protect them from, from all the people that are going to try to take advantage of them. Yeah, yeah, that's that's good. Yeah, um, Hank, when has, I, uh, yeah. Ahead, sorry, Hold on, I, Hank. I was just going to ask, you know, because you mentioned, you know, it, since it's flooded, obviously your homeowner's insurance doesn't come into play. What about people's cars and things along those lines? Does uh, your car insurance cover that? Or? I think it's car insurance. Car yeah, car insurance is going to take care of the of the car part of the loss. Uh-huh. Um, if you have a, a, the adequate coverage, obviously, sure. right. but. Um, most of the time, you know, they're just going to total it. I mean, it's 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 very uncommon that they'll try to fix a flooded car. I mean, there's just so many electronics and things that will go bad, you know, a week, two weeks, a month from now, yeah. that it's, it's not worth trying. Yeah. Um, and then that's the other thing, too, to watch out, watch out for in the future. Um, all these cars are getting total. They'll have rebuilt titles. It's, it's, it's what, what it's called. Um, yeah. So when you, when you start looking for used cars, make sure you're watching out for rebuilt title. Uh, that may be a flooded car, and it, that's just probably not a very good vehicle to purchase. Gotcha. Okay. Hank, uh, I know you had a hand up, wanted to ask something. Yeah. Uh, hey, Bernardo. Hey, um, I've, got, I've got a listing on the river in Newport Ritchie, and it had about three feet of water in it. Uh, the home is owned outright, but they did have uh, flood insurance. But this will be their uh, third strike, so to speak. And um, I'm not familiar with the rule about they have to build up now or or something to that effect where they can't rebuild the home as is. Um, is can you explain that to me? Can you help um, clarify I, I, that? I'm, Are you familiar with that? I, I'm familiar with it, but I'm I'm going to answer your question in a superficial way because it is pretty detailed, and I don't want to. I don't want to say something that is not 100% accurate. Uh, so once you have multiple okay. claims, it becomes expensive. And at some point, it's going to become impossible to insure the home. Um, I'll, I'll do a little bit more homework on this. And I'll try to put a summary of what the rules are. Um, and I'll, I'll send it over to you, Hank. And maybe we can post it to everyone um, to, to be able to have access to it. Um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail because I, I don't want to misspeak and, and, and tell anyone the wrong information at this point. Thank you. Okay, I understand. They, they want to um, market the house as is without filing a claim. At least that's what they're thinking. But um, is that is that even possible or do they have to file a claim? Do you, can you answer that? They don't have to file the claim. But the problem is if they don't file the claim, I mean, they're 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 going to take a huge hit on it. So I, I guess if he adds up to them not to do it, they're going to have to disclose no matter what. So 
Right. Uh, they're not obligated yeah. to file a claim, no. And then you have to find yeah, a buyer we, for that property. Yeah, well, yeah they mean, are gonna. They are gonna disclose, obviously, because <laughs> right. they're surrounded by neighbors that are in the same boat, and it's not like it could ever be kept secret. Um, right. You know, they're they're just throwing their hands up. You know, at this point, they're just they're over it, so they yeah. just want to. I mean, get rid of the problem. To to be a hundred percent honest, on Saturday night and and then on Sunday. Uh, when I started meeting with my neighbors and I started helping them carry their stuff out of their house because they were all uh, occupied, the first response from pretty much almost all of them was, I'm done, I'm out, I'm not going to fix it, I, I, I'll take 100 bucks for it and I'm out of here, here's the keys, I'm going to throw it on the mailbox and I'm out of here. By Monday, that sentiment has gone away. I think the stress and the reality of what happened has sinking in and 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 people are now kind of taking a step back and going, okay, well, let's fix it. You know, it, it was the first time that it happened in who knows, uh, 50 years or whatever. So um, that's something to, to also tell your clients is, you know, hey, take a week, think about it. Don't, yeah. don't, don't pull the trigger so quickly. Uh, what do they say? Like, they don't make any more. So it's different, but you know, don't they say like, don't make any major decisions when you're going through yeah. any kind of, yeah traumatic experience right. in whether in one and any any way anyway i got a call on sunday morning from one of our insurance clients uh who was flooded over in dana shores um they had a mitigation comp they had a crew that came by and offered to do all the mitigation mitigation meaning take the drywall take the furniture okay. out they're not going to treat it. They're not going to do anything crazy technical because they didn't have a license for it. But they offered to do it for, I think it was $4,000. Uh, this is a 1,600 square foot, one story home. The next guy that came over asked for 7000 Then they had three more people come over and the highest one was 30000 And I think there was somewhere, somewhere around the twenty grand. So that's that's probably the main thing to watch out for is don't sign a contract with any of these people until you know how much the insurance is going to pay for. And I, I can't really attest to this 100%, but they're saying somewhere around 350 to 450 a square foot. It's kind of the going rate the insurance will expect to pay. Uh, and then if there's flooring to be uh, ripped out as well, I think they can add about 2 to $3 on top of that. So... From what I'm hearing, anything over seven, eight dollars a square foot, it's it's being overcharged, nice. uh, and that's for removal only, not treatment of the, assuming that there's no mold already to be treated and so on. So mm -hmm. you know, if you start seeing those ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollar bids to to tear out a house, I mean that's way too much. And if you sign that contract and the insurance company only pays half of it or or, or five grand, then you're on the hook for the rest of it. Um, yeah. So you know, just just be careful with that, guys. Yeah. Bernardo, yeah, this, this sense. Uh, sorry, man. Go ahead. Finish up. That's okay. This isn't their primary residence, so it's a. Uh, you know, that's what that that's the reason they're willing to just, uh, you know, go as is. But all right, I'll have some more conversation with them, and and because he's he's capable. This is what he, he you know he owns multiple properties and things of that nature, so he can do right. the work himself. Um, so. All right. Well, I'll have conversations with them, more conversation regarding what we've talked about. And I'll yeah, look I mean, for that information I, I, from you, Bernardo. Yeah, I, I think the base of your question was instead of having three claims, only having two claims and selling it. Obviously, that would be ideal. That would be a better setup than trying to sell it with three you know, paid claims on it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's going to really be up to them and, and how much that's going to depreciate the property and so on. Gotcha. Uh, Thank Bernard, you. I wanted to ask when um, it, it may be not the the best, uh, maybe salt for um, uh, for an insurance guy. Yeah. But uh, what is your thought and stance on public adjusters and you know a, a homeowner hiring one of them to kind of help with all that they're going through? Uh, it, you know, does that help them at all? You know, get more money. Um. um it, it, it does, as long as you're, it's just like hiring a good attorney, a good realtor, a good dentist. I mean, you have to pick someone that is, ha that, that is going to have your best interest in mind. 
sure. and not someone that is going to try to, for lack of a better term, milk the system, right? Uh, what happens occasionally, and I don't want to make it a general statement, is uh, they end up trying to run the bill up so high that it has a reverse effect on the homeowner, meaning, right. you know, the loss was 30 grand, the insurance company is only, trying, only willing to pay 20. Now the adjuster, the public adjuster is trying to get that up to 40, 50 grand. Uh, and then the homeowner ends up not getting uh, put back where he was before the loss. So I, I would say it's a good thing to do if you start running into a problem. Mm -hmm. I don't think it would be something I would start from the get-go, uh, you know, start the claim and then go ahead and do that right off the bat. Um, you know, there are situations where that's going to come handy. The one thing that I would tell people not to do it ever, uh, and it never may be a little too much, but from experience of seeing what happens, uh, it, it ends up being a bad idea most of the time is doing an assignment of benefit which is basically that when you're signing off your rights with the insurance company to a third party and adjuster, a, a, a restoration company or whatever, oh, yeah. uh, so they can address the problem on your behalf. And once you do that, you lose control of the situation and you don't know where, where the numbers are going and, and how it's going to get dealt with. So that's something that if you're going to sign and make sure you're doing it with a company that you're a hundred percent trust because uh, once it's signed, you completely lose control of, of the entire process. Gotcha. Yes, Byron. Byron. yes Byron. Byron's got a question. Bernardo, can you hear me? Yes, sir. So question on rental insurance. So two parts kind of. For, would homeowner's insurance for the owner of the property help cover anything for the renters that are renting? And the second part would be the renters that do have rental insurance, how do they, what's their process? All right, so there's there's two parts on, on the renter's insurance part of it. You can have renter's insurance that is the standard that, that everyone kind of thinks of, which is going to be for hurricane, uh, for fire liability. And then there's a flood policy for renters, uh, which most people don't know about. Uh, so if you have a property on the beach and you have a tenant in it, uh, you have, you as the owner, you have your flood insurance and you have your homeowner's insurance, which will take care of, you know, your, your hurricane, your fire, so on. And then your flood insurance for, obviously for flooding of replacing the property itself. Um, and you have a tenant in there that has only renter's insurance. Uh, in the situation we're in today, they're, they're, they have nothing to fall back on. It's not going to pay for flood unless they so have their personal items payment. won't be. Their personal items wouldn't be covered. Then... It will be covered by, by the owner's pro policy and it, it won't be covered by the renter's policy by the unless they have a, a specific flood policy. So as I, I you know I had rentals on the beach now for over 20 years, and I have never mentioned flood uh, renters flood insurance uh, to my tenants. Uh, and I'm an insurance guy, so I always tell them to get uh, renter's insurance, but I never thought that that would be an issue because, you know, the units I have never flooded before and they've been there for 50 years. So I, I guess moving forward, we have to change the way we do some things uh, and try to at least, you know, bring that to people's attention so they know that it's not covered and it is available if they choose to purchase. Good to know. I'm so, you know, I'm trying to read it. Yeah, yeah. I'm trying to get us those readable. When, um, you know, talking with, with Michael uh, Cochran, um, you know, a lot of people may have uh, properties under contract that were set to close Monday, Friday, whenever, but everything got shut down. What are you seeing, you know, as far as uh, lenders wanting pictures done, new inspections? Does that need to be done by the appraiser? Uh, Great question. So, um if, if it's in one of the declared counties, which this area is, um, then we do need a reinspection. In, in lieu of waiting for the reinspection, what we can get on our end, um, some lenders will allow this, uh, most uh, direct lenders will, some brokers won't, but it's gonna be lender specific. They're gonna definitely want something. Um, what we're allowing is the listing agent to take pictures of the property or the seller to take pictures of the property uh, time stamp the pictures or interior, exterior. So you got to get an understanding of the outside of the property, the interior to make sure there's no damage. 
If there's no visible damage, that's good. Then we get a certification from the buyer that they don't know any damage um, to be done. They sign it. And then we have the seller sign the same thing, uh, basically attesting that there's no damage that they're aware of. And we can close. And then we get a post inspection. We'll have the appraiser go back out and do a post inspection to make sure that, you know, to validate all this. So then we um, have done our due diligence on the back end and we can still close. Um, so we have a closing tomorrow, for example, that we did exactly that. Um, and we got pictures from the agent and everything, everything checked out, fortunately, for this buyer. Um, if there are problems, then then obviously it can't close and, and we need to look at whether it's going to go through an insurance thing or if we need to flip it to a renovation loan or however that's going to look. But if the property is good to go, that helps avoid having to do having to wait for the appraiser to do the inspection and get it back to us, because I'm sure the appraisers are backed up um, getting those completed because those are going to be added to their already uh, current workload. Right on. Okay. Yeah, that's kind of a, I'm glad you said that, the current workload. Just let's keep that in mind too, guys. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the lender side, on the title side, and, and I'm sure for Bernardo on the insurance side, we're all backed up because we've had, we had files that were, properties and files, whatever, that were supposed to close last week. Uh, even if there's no damage and everybody's wanting to move forward, we're all trying to reorganize yeah. for files that were scheduled to close this week. So those are kind of moving forward um, and then getting in the stuff from last week. So just, I would just say everybody, just a little grace and patience, just yeah. grace and patience. And we are all moving as quickly as we can. I'm sure Michael is on his side, Bernardo as well. Michael, from a lending standpoint, how would uh, someone finance uh, Hank's listing? The one that, that, that they're taking up now. <laughs> Well, they wouldn't. You could do a renovation loan. And the, the things about a renovation loan is, is when you do an inspection, the inspection is provided to the contractor. The contractor then has to put the property in livable, livable condition. So whatever is, um, whether there's wood rot, whether there's water damage, all of that needs to be mitigated, needs to be replaced, needs to be repaired. Because as a lender, we just care about the final product when, when everything's completed. So if the right. contractor feels they can rebuild it and whatever they can do, that's great. Now, the numbers have to jive because if the cost, the, if the repair costs exceed the uh, cost of purchase plus the repairs, then the math doesn't work. Doesn't work. Um, that's why they so would, would it be a 2 or 3K type of, type of, type of loan? Or? Absolutely. You could do a home style, which is a conventional version. You could do a 2 or 3K. Um, I don't know on your end um, how you would look at that on insurance, you know, from a, you know, it would be impossible to get flood insurance. That's for sure. <laughs> well, most of the renovations we do is, is people just want to upgrade the homes. Um, right. I have seen instances where there was fire damage and they completely gutted the house and have done similar where it's basically you're removing damage and, and recreating it, but it would be really come down to the cost of repair. Does the numbers jive with the acquisition costs and the repair costs? And would uh, would if the home was already mitigated, meaning it's dry, it's ready to be rebuilt, uh, and it's only let's say cabinetry and drywall, uh, mm -hmm. would the lenders allow the a, a escrow uh, hold back on on the, or escrow uh, scenario where the the buyer can put let's say a hundred grand in escrow for the repairs versus doing the rehab loan? Is that an uh, an, op an option? Possibly. Well? The most common escrows are usually small. They're usually, and what I mean small is five, 10, 15 grand. 15 is probably on the high side. Um, I've seen $50,000 escrow holdbacks in us closing the loan. Um, I think that's the largest I've seen. If okay. it's getting excessive or larger, um, the reason why you want a renovation loan is you kind of really, as a lender, we really want that um, formality of the relationship already with the contractor having their insurance in a, in a, in a plan. Um, gotcha you know, in place. All right. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to get to the one question, uh, Bernardo, can you um, scroll a little bit? Byron. Oh, not, uh, Byron. I'm sorry. Byron. Yeah, Byron. Bernardo, you don't have to worry about yeah, it. Byron's going to take care of it. I think it's more <laughs> of a question for Bernardo, but right. um, can you scroll a little bit more? I can't read you, it. There can. Oh, there's nothing there. Okay. Uh, so Joe Martino had a question. 
I have a seller client I was working with to list their home until the hurricane. They have a raised home located on a saltwater canal in St. Pete. The bottom floor consists of a garage and additional open space that they converted to a living space, added a bathroom, kitchen, bedroom, etc. Since that space isn't part of their living space, it is not covered by their flood insurance policy. Do they have any coverage at all for that space or is it a total loss? If not, would FEMA provide any coverage? Um, it's going to depend a lot on the age of the home. If it's a newer home, the answer is going to be no, uh, because it was obviously an illegal area. Uh, it was uh -huh. built you know, uh, without permits and it was not supposed to be there altogether. Um, if it's an older home and, and older, it, it's going to have to be pre firm which is going to be, it has to be like probably built in the 60s and stuff, which there's not a whole lot of elevated homes that were built back in those days. Right. Uh, if that's the case, then it, it, the coverage will be there from the get-go anyways. Um, there are some situations where I have seen uh, some of the homes with the coastal basement, which is basically the elevated home with the garage uh, under, where a conversion was done into a game room, into a, you know, a, whatever a bonus room you want to call it. And um, the person decided to insure it. And it's an arm and a leg to, to ensure this type of things. But, um, you know, it, it, it is, it, you, you can insure it. It's just the cost of it a lot of times doesn't, doesn't justify sense. it. So in this right. case, if they don't have the insurance uh, for that particular area, it, it, I don't think they're going to get any money from the insurance company for sure. From FEMA, that, that's a whole different ballgame. I don't know if that's going to fly either because, Technically speaking, you know they're they're taking money away from someone that played by the rules and 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 they're technically not. Uh, right. So you know uh, that that that's a FEMA question that I don't know that I can answer to be honest. Gotcha, gotcha. So you know, I was listening to everybody here speak. Um, you know, the agents who have active or who had an active listing that the property flooded. I think the best course of it, and the seller is planning to file a claim, the best course of action is that seller and you as a listing agent should really just take the property off the market. Take it off temporarily or, you know, even cancel the listing right now until they figure it out. Until mm -hmm. they work through whatever insurance they're going to likely get. Because, I mean, what are we talking about as far as turnaround time, would you say, Bernardo? Somebody files a claim Today, granted, they get the adjuster out there in a couple of days. Gets well, approved. in my case, um, we filed the claim on Sunday. The adjuster's coming out on the 9th. So okay. once he comes over, it will probably be a week for him to get back with us with any kind of dollar amount of, of, of repair. Um, and then at that point, you know, the clock will start ticking and then I started ordering appliances uh, yesterday already. I started buying drywall. I'm, I'm kind of buying the whole thing out of pocket. And then yeah. I'll just give it to the contractor and have them give me a credit for it because I'm, I'm afraid that we're going to start running short on things. Yeah. Uh, so we got appliances already ordered. We got all the stuff that is already kind of on queue to start the rebuild. Um, and our, our urgency of doing is to be able to provide homes to the neighbors next door to us. Because they're, they're probably going to be, you know, sitting for three, four, five months because they don't have experience on doing this stuff, that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I want to get my property done so I, so I can let my neighbor next door move into it as quickly as possible. Um, That's my, very kind uh, of you. That's wonderful. That? That's very kind of you. Well, I mean, that's, that's what we're supposed to do in this time, exactly. right? Exactly. We're that's, supposed to help people out. That's right. Uh, my, that's Michael, we're um, about. Forbearance, uh, anything that we need to know about that? I mean, we're going to start getting those calls from the lenders offering uh, mm -hmm. those type of situations. How does that affect credit? How does that affect uh, the homeowner if they decide to take that option? Great question. So that's going to be, I mean, that we haven't received any information on how that's going to be handled just yet. But if they do, and it's it's likely that that could be an option, um, you know, it's it's. If you don't pay your mortgage, it is going to show that you're behind. Now, if the agreement is that they're not going to report it to credit, that's you know that's one thing. If it's the buyer decides to do it because they've gotten semi permission and it's okay that you do it, it really depends on the particulars of the forbearance whether 
it's going to be credit reporting or not. And I think it's very important that the homeowners understand the difference, you know, because if a lot of times the government will say you can do something and there are implications to your credit, like we'll, we'll let you skip a payment, but they're going to put it on the back end and it's going to show you're late on your credit or they may not. So it's really specific on if they do that, what is, what are the particulars? Um, you know, there, there's some interesting things while I'm thinking about it is you mentioned 203K. Um, 203B is the normal um, FHA loan. And then there's a 203H. So 203H will be interesting. It, it's probably going to be allowed for this scenario. So if homeowners have a home that's a, like gone and, or they choose not to, to rebuild it and that's a legitimate reason, they can do a 203H, which is basically the way they usually work is traditionally 100% financing to be able to purchase a new home um, through FHA shown that they had a disaster property. If this forbearance thing happens and they end up showing late on their credit, there will be some forgiveness and allowance to do this product even though they have a current mortgage because of the loss of the property. So that's something good as you're talking to current buyers and homeowners of like, well, what happens to this mortgage? What am I going to do? What are my options for the future? This 203H is going to be something to put their bug, a bug in their ear to look into, to call a lender like myself or one of your uh, other lenders that you work with um, to explore that option. Yeah. I mean, the reason I'm asking is back in 08 or 09, we had lenders calling, uh, people calling in for a loan modification or for a short sale or whatever. And they were getting told that they need to miss payments in order for that to work. And the next thing you know, they miss the payment, their credit cards start spinning out of control, and then they're in bankruptcy over a bad advice from, from a, a you know call center lend, um, bank. Customer service, right? Up. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So is it common for a forbearance to be on paper? So like if, if, if someone is looking for that, because I had two, two clients called already asking uh, about that uh since they don't have any money coming for for temporary shelter um they're they're struggling you know in between do i rent a house and pay for the rent or and miss my my uh mortgage payment um if they were to come to that agreement with a lender would would it be wise or it would be normal for them to get something in writing from the lender allowing it or is it all verbal no, you definitely want it right. You definitely want to know the details. You definitely want to know what it's going to do to your credit. You want to, the devil's in the details. So you want to make sure you're asking those questions. This is a great topic. You need to know exactly what they're allowing you to do and then make your decision. Um, will they allow you to skip payments? Will they ask you to get late? All of those are, are those, all of those are possibilities, but the biggest misconception is is they said it was okay. And then all of a sudden they find out later that's on their credit and undoing that is the problem. So it's right. okay you need to do that. Just you need, you need to know what you're getting yourself into. Right. 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 Is, that's is what I told them. I said, you know, just make sure it's in writing that it's not going to affect your credit. Um, we'll probably know in the next weeks or so if that's going to start coming out of, uh, you know, if lenders are going to start offering and, and kind of from there on. And it depends on the government too. Like during COVID, they were much more flexible on how it affected the credit. So we'll have to see, you know, what the policy is and the direction that, you know, the government gives, because that does matter too. Perfect. Let's hope that's Anything. what happens. Let's For hope the, we give these folks a little break. Yeah. yeah. For the homeowner that, you know, they, they didn't have flood insurance for whatever reason. They don't, you know, they got to go find a rental now. Um, going along the same lines, Bernardo saying, you know, the forbearance and whatnot. Is it possible for an homeowner to refinance and pull some cash out at this point in time with uh, with such a damaged property? Or it, it's all going to depend on the numbers, of course, whether there is equity and, and not. But how challenging would that be if, you know, agents are reaching out to their past clients and they're like, I just don't have any cash to do this. Right, yeah. Can I can I pull it cash out? out I, yeah. So on a cash out refi, you have to do title work. You have to do an appraisal. Um, and it's going to be listed as one of the counties that was impacted. So from a lender side, we're going to, our flags are going to be up and we're going to want to like investigate the property. So that's probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. um, home equity lines are more um, automated. So the, uh, the appraisal is sometimes not even done if there's enough data out there. And, and most of the places our consumers and, and all of us live, it's pretty uh, densely populated. So the likelihood of an, a home equity line being automated 
um, you know, with someone like us is, is pretty probable. Um, I haven't heard whether they're going to uh, flag those counties. I mean, if I were um, the underwriter making the decision, I probably would um, mm -hmm. and uh, classify it as, you know, something that we need to have at least a visual on. Um, but that's a good question. I, I would say the probability of getting cash out on a home that's damaged is, is probably gonna be pretty tough. Mm -hmm. There might be some loopholes. Um, the 203H is, is really the lending option. If this home doesn't, isn't going to work anymore, the 203H is basically to allow for um, you to have very limited out of pocket to get a new home because you don't have a place to live. Could they refi to the 203? Say that again? Could they refi on a 203 and then get the money to spend? The 203H is for a new purchase. Thanks. Okay. So a new property purchase. And is that the same for 203K? Is that a new purchase as well? You can't no, 203K, purchase. you can do refi or purchase. Okay. So so would that be an option? To, if you didn't have the funds to, or if you didn't have insurance coverage, could they do a 203K refi? Yep. Yep. And essentially pull, well, they don't get the funds, do they? It goes in a... It goes in an account. Basically what they're going to do is they're going to get an inspection. Um, whether it's a purchase or a refi, you're going to get an inspection. The inspector is going to say what needs to be repaired. Gotcha. The contractor is going to look at that, and the contractor is going to build a bid based on that. Now, the, the caveat is, is let's say it's $100,000 to repair, and you owe $300,000. Is the home worth four hundred? dollars If it's only worth three fifty, dollars the math doesn't work. So it really depends on how much you owe versus how much the home's going to be worth after the renovations are done, if you're doing a refi. Gotcha. Before hurricanes, when you did a renovation, it you the math usually worked where you had more equity um, because you didn't over improve, you just upgraded. So you actually built in equity. But with repairing stuff that's destroyed, that's where it's going to be. Um, it's it's going to depend on what you owe, if it's going to work or not. Okay. okay. Yeah, I just want to get some options out there for, yeah. you know. We have okay. another question up somewhere. Uh, yeah, I think no, but down, down, down. I think you asked it. Catherine was asking about the is. condo yeah. rider. Um, she didn't see it in Skyslope. Uh, it's in there. Um, so if you don't see it, um, uh, use the search box and type in condo. Uh, it should come up. If not, um, you know, shoot me an email. I'll send you a copy of it. But as far as I know, it's in there. And uh, speaking of forms, just since we're asking that question, I know we went over this last week, but um, with commissions and, uh, you know, buyer broker, you have the buyer brokerage agreement and you're asking the seller for your compensation. Um, there's obviously many different ways you can go about this. You know, we've, we've come up with a few different solutions, whether you put in other terms that this contract is contingent upon the seller uh, executing a compensation agreement with the uh, with Charles Rutenberg Realty and then doing the compensation agreement. Uh, well, we also came up with uh, this other rider that's called the buyer broker compensation rider. This is only in Rutenberg files. It's not in form simplicity or transaction desk or sky slope. Um, and this would allow you to simply check the box in paragraph 19 on the contract. Um, it, the other box, I'm sorry, and put in buyer broker compensation have this filled out and signed, that way it gets attached to the contract. So uh, we just wanted to add that extra um, option there in order for you to secure your compensation. So um, another question. Oh, is it on the dashboard? The, the rider, uh, Catherine, is it on the dashboard? Yes, it's on the dashboard, uh, but it's not on form simplicity or anything along those lines. So. All right, any All right. other any tips, else? tricks? Hmm? No? Tina, what you got going on? All for, right. Uh, so just again, real quick, let me just reiterate donations. Please come by when you can today, tomorrow, Monday, Tuesday. Uh, Byron has the list up there. Let's talk about the calendar. Uh, we've got CMA and appraisals tomorrow from 10 to 12 in-house. Uh, you'll want to sign up and it's almost full. Yeah, I think there's only two spots left on that. So okay. You know, well, yeah. If you want to get in, it's going to be a great class with uh, Bernardo and uh, John Barcello, he's uh, with Option Appraisals. Uh, they're a huge uh, national appraising company, but uh, he's going to go over 
basically A to Z on appraisals and what you can expect with, uh, you know, the new compensation rules and things along those lines. So definitely tap into it if you can. Um, Sorry. No, oh. no, no. I, I'm so <laughs> enthralled by all of this information. Uh, October 8th, 10 a.m. AI Canva workshop in-house with this guy over here, Byron, that you can't see. Who else is coming to that, Byron? Anybody that you know of, maybe? Candace, probably not. Okay. Mm. I'll come, but you're going to be the expert. <laughs> all right. So Michael Cochran will be there to look pretty. And Byron will be there for your AI Canva stuff. Yes. Uh, October 8th, same day at 6 p.m. Listing agreement and modification. That's via Zoom. Uh, on the 9th, again, we'll be back here for our broker update. And then immediately following 11 a.m. forms workshop in-house. You have to sign up for that. I think that's all we have on the that's calendar. Uh, Jen uh, actually oh. had a question. Um when you're when you're trying to research the vendors, Bernardo, um, you know, what's the best way to make sure that they're insured, bonded is, you know, should they just go to the, you know, check the DVPR to verify license? Yeah, the, the Nellis County has a has a site that you can check the, their license, make sure there's no complaints against it. So I would I would start there. Uh, Bear, Do you Bear, know what that site is, Bernardo? What's up? Do you know what that site is for Pinellas? Um, I'll look it up and uh, I'll put it up here in a second. Okay, gotcha. But yeah, uh, I would say, um, you know, not to reiterate what Bernardo was going to say, uh, you can go to myfloridalicense.com um, and uh, there's a yellow button halfway down the page that says verify a license. You, if you get that contractor's info, you can go right there, pop it in and verify if their license is active. Uh, then you can obviously go to sunbiz.org uh, verify that their uh, business is, is registered with the state. Um, and then, of course, you know, Bernardo can let you know about the Pinellas County uh, site that they have. So the Pinellas County is PCCLB.com. So Pinellas County uh, Construction Licensing Board.com, uh, mm -hmm. but it's only the LB. initials. Yeah, so P as in Paul, CC, L as in Larry, B as in Boy.com. Well, there you go. Very cool. All right. Yeah. So, um, anybody I'll else? I you know, think I'm. Anybody have any questions before we say goodbye? I don't. I think. I guess not. Great all great right. Time. Well, we appreciate you all being here today. Yes. And uh, I think we did cover a lot of great information. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Thank you Bernardo. Thanks, um, Bernardo. Welcome, yeah, guys. Up time right now, and uh, you know, it, it's yeah. very helpful to have this information. And don't forget, it, agents, if you are going through that tough time as well, please reach out. You know, yes. we definitely, we want to help. Yep, so. we want to help. We Let us know what we can do. All right, everybody, have a great week, and uh, we'll see you soon. See you guys. See you soon. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.